Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship today. We're glad that you're here. We want to extend a, extend a special hello to our online viewers and invite you to make your presence known. If you're joining us in the sanctuary, it means that you all changed your clock back. To <laughs> Please fill out your Connect card, tear it off your bulletin, and place it in the offering plates as the children come around the aisles during the offertory song. If this is your first time joining us in the sanctuary, please be sure to pick up a welcome bag from the table in the entryway. It has lots of information about our church to help you get acquainted with us. Club 316, our youth group for kids 10 and older, is meeting on Thursdays from 6.30 to 8 in the youth room. Contact Christy Thompson if you have any questions. If you would like to order a poinsettia to help decorate the church during Advent, there are order forms on the welcome table in the entryway. And this year, the flowers will be purchased for $11.50, and your order must be in by November the 14th. All monies need to be into the office by December the 5th. We are currently in the process of forming a visitation team to help care for our members who are homebound and in nursing homes or rehab facilities. Please pray about this and uh, indicate if you would be willing to participate by marking your Connect card. And we're looking at doing teams, so it's not going to be single people going. The November newsletters are available on the welcome table, and Signe Nicholson has some words to speak at this time. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm Signe Nicholson, and I'm currently serving as the interim financial chairperson. Uh, about a week or two ago, um, I had the opportunity to attend my first administrative council meeting and um, present the financial report of the church, and um, I want to share it with you as well. Um, numbers aren't necessarily everybody's favorite thing, even though they're my favorite thing, but that's okay. Some people are into flowers, go figure. Um, could we have the first slide? Okay. So to put the church's finances in perspective, just so you have some idea, we all have our household budgets. The church has a budget too, and it is $180,000 a year. That's what we spent, that's what we hopefully receive and hopefully spend each year to operate the church. All the expenses, heat, electricity, staff, um, Purell hand sanitizer, <laughs> um, all, all that stuff. So, and last year, 2020, the budget was 180,000. This year it's 180,000, and as you'll see in a couple of Sundays, we're gonna, maybe by next Sunday, we will run off a copy of the budget for um, 2022, if any of you are interested, and um, have them available, but the budget for next year is just about the same thing also. Um, our spending last year, uh, we didn't intend it to be COVID related, but it ended up being that way. Uh, when they put together the budget, would have been in 2019 for 2020, of course, we didn't anticipate all the changes that would occur to the operation of the church and um, our worship patterns. So instead of what we thought we were gonna spend our money on, we spend our money on COVID related items, including a lot, of, a lot more in cleaning because we had to sanitize everything and um, technology for online worship. And what, that, what happened was there was a significant shift, as you all know, and those of you who are continuing to worship online, you know, um, that uh, we needed technology to support a, a more robust online worship presence. So that was the focus of last year's spending. This year, um, we were able to return to a, more of a sense of normal, and so our spending has focused, as we intended last year for it too, on children and youth ministries and on energy efficient improvements to the church. We're already seeing the benefit of the LED lights that replace the old energy and efficient ones. We've been saving thousands of dollars, literally, on our electric bill, which is such a blessing. The next thing will be windows that are more energy efficient, so we all stay toastier in the winter and cooler in the summer. 
And then an unforeseen expense this year was a very pricey septic system repair, which and if any of you are on septic as our family is, you have to do it. <laughs> when you have to do it, you have to do it. Next slide. Um, so the upshot of that all is that, uh, uh, so then I, I guess, so that, that's looking at the year. In the middle of October, which is when our, um, the church council met, um, I looked at year to date this year compared to year to date last year. So we were comparing apples to apples and I was surprised and a little unhappy to see that this year we actually have received $20,000 less in tithes and offerings and gifts than we did last year, even though we're back in church and typically people tend to give when they come and um, there were fewer of us actually in the queue last year. So that could be a timing issue, don't know. But our giving is down 20,000 compared to last year and our spending is 40,000 higher. So that's not a great combination and I, I wasn't real excited about having my first time to address the congregation to be news like this. Um, but, next slide, I want to remind you that it's not like God is unaware of things. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills and um, he calls on all of us to um, return to him, recognize that he is the God of all creation and sustains our lives with joyful hearts. So I invite you to um, let his spirit touch your heart with generosity and be aware that we are being as good stewards as we can possibly be to take care of you as a congregation, both um, individually through our staff investments and physically through um, the, the wonderful job that the trustees does with the physical plant of the church. And um, I just want to give God all the glory, even when from our perspective, the timing doesn't quite synchronize the way we would like it to. Thank you very much. Okay, please check your bulletin for more announcements. And then will you please stand and join me for our morning prayer. Lord, thank you for a night's rest and the opportunity to come together today. Today is another day you've made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. We know you love us. Your word makes us understand the depth of your love for us, and we thank you for this boundless love. Will you continue to stand for our first song? Set life. 
may come forward at this time. Hey guys, how are you all? Good, I'm glad to see you. What are you talking about? Oh, you're like you're liking to get to sit by salvation. I know. He's a cool guy, for sure. Uh, <laughs> well today we're going to talk about a story that we find in the Gospel of Mark, the New Testament. And it's about a, a woman who is a widow. Do you know what a widow is? What's a widow? Right, it's a woman whose husband has died. She was married, and then her husband died for whatever reason. And so this particular widow was um, poor. She didn't have much money. But one day, Jesus was sitting in the temple court, and they had kind of a box there that people would go, and they would put all their offerings in. And some people would come in, and they'd have like a big bag of gold, and they'd put all their money into the offering box. Um, but this woman only had two little coins, and they were worth about a penny apiece. And she put that into the offering. And Jesus called his disciples together, and he said, hey, I want you to see this. Do you see that, that, that poor widow who just put two little pennies in there? He goes, you know what? She put in more money than anybody else who came here today. That's what the disciples' faces looked like, Mikey. They were like, what? How could that be? But you know what he said? He said, here's the thing. She gave everything she had because she trusted God to take care of her. So do you think that God, um, let me ask you this. Do you think God cares about give, us giving back to him? Yeah, he does. He cares that we give to him because it helps show our love, our appreciation, our thankfulness. Do you think that he cares that, say, Jackson only has a quarter, and let's say Maya has $2, and they put that money in the offering plate, do you think that, that God likes Maya better than Jackson? No. no, he doesn't. That's not fair. Okay, we'll change the story. Let's say Jackson had $5, <laughs> and Evelyn had a penny. And Jackson put $5 in the offering, and Evelyn put a penny. Is God going to love Jackson more than Evelyn? No. no. All of us. He loves all of us, exactly. And, he, and when you give from your heart, it doesn't matter. How much money you give. Exactly. It doesn't matter how much money you give. It's how much love you give. You could have just done this whole thing here. It's exactly right. God looks at your heart. He looks at your heart. So I know sometimes when I was a little girl, I would take my offering to Sunday school, and I would put like a quarter in the box, and sometimes I would be like, well, I don't know if that's really worth anything. But you know what? That was all the money I had that day. Yeah, just a quarter. I was poor. I was very God looked at that, and he said, well done, good and faithful servant. And that's what he says to you, too. Don't put any fake dollars in. Only put real dollars in. God can't do so much with Monopoly money, but I don't know. He's a miracle worker, so maybe so. He probably could. You're right. Okay. Before we get too far off track, let's pray. Father God, we're so grateful for and girls, and we thank you for their uh, sweet spirits. Father, help us remember that you don't love us for the size of our gift. You love us for the size of our heart. So thank you, Jesus. We love you, and it's in your name we pray these things. Amen. 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 Salvation, will you pass those out for me today? Go down there and just pass them out as we go. Right. Here, stand up. Stand up and go right down there. Yeah. Yeah, right down there. Look at that. Look at these kids following directions. Or not. <laughs> It is okay. Now, now he's going to go from pew to pew. Here you go. Here you go. <coughs> We're glad you're here today. Lots going on in our world. Lots going on 
in our church. Those of you that um, knew uh, Romana and Jack Hinesley, Romana passed away earlier this year. Jack Hinesley passed away the uh, day before yesterday. So we need to be keeping his family in our prayers. Um, lots of people are still um, sick at home um, in the nursing home. Jane Bird um, actually got taken to the hospital again from uh, the spring, so I went to see her on Friday, and she's doing pretty well, but, you know, it's so fun to be in the hospital. So look at your uh, paper that's inside your bulletin that lists the, the names of those people that are on um, your, your paper and uh, be praying for them, intercessing for them. If you notice that somebody's not here who usually is here this morning, lift up a prayer for them as well. So worship team is going to call us to prayer, and um, then I'm going to give you some time to talk to Jesus. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ, his son. And now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. Because of Oh, most holy, holy Father, we do give thanks to you. You are above all others. You alone are our healer, our protector, our provider, the lover of our soul. And Lord, we are so thankful for who you are. And Lord, we are thankful for who we are in you, that we are your beloved. We are the apple of your eye. And you do not take that for granted. Father, during this service time, I just lift up all of those uh, who are home today, perhaps watching online, those that are sick, those that are not feeling well, Lord, and I just ask that you pour out your healing upon them. Father, for those here in the sanctuary gathered together, I give thanks to you for the fellowship of believers. And I ask that you speak to each one of our hearts this morning. Help us receive the message that you want us to hear. Father, for those who are struggling in the world, for the unknown in other countries and in the politics and in the general chaos that seems to be going on, Lord, we know that you are sovereign and that your will will be done. Father, for those who are not here yet, we ask that you send them to us and that when they come, they will be received with radical hospitality. And now, Lord, as we remember the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, we lift our voices as one saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to continue now in our worship as we give back to God his tithes and our offerings. Stand for the doxology. Father God, how grateful we are to you that we can lay these, your tithes and our offerings upon the altar, knowing that they're going to give you glory and that they will advance your kingdom. Oh, how we love you, Jesus. And it's in your precious name we pray these things. Amen. You may be seated. and mistakes come 
today there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Thank you to the ensemble. I appreciate you very much. Well, for the past three months, we have been spending um, our time in the Gospels of Matthew and in Mark as we've moved through this time in the liturgical calendar called ordinary time. Now you might think that the person who made up this liturgical calendar called it ordinary time because it's there's nothing extraordinary going on, you know, like there's no Christmas tide, there's no Advent, there's no Pentecost and Easter tide or Lent, but that's not what ordinary time means. Ordinary time is actually the ordinal numbers of the um, numbering of the Sundays past Pentecost. They always start with like first Sunday after Pentecost, second 
Sunday after Pentecost, third Sunday after Pentecost, and what brings us today, which we are in the 24th Sunday after Pentecost, the birthday of the church, and on the first day of Advent, which is November 28th, we start the, the church calendar all over again. That is the beginning of our church year. Um, and so this, this ordinary time is designated as a time of spiritual growth. And that's why we've really been following Jesus as he goes through his ministry and mission in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark. And hopefully we get a better sense of who Jesus is so that we can pattern our lives after who Jesus is. And we've heard Jesus calling us to a different kind of existence. Um, everything that Jesus did was in obedience to the Father. Everything he did was in a humble spirit. And so as we look at that, as we are trying to be biblically formed and humbly submitted disciples of Jesus Christ, we can look at that example of Jesus and get a clearer vision of who he is when we just like immerse ourselves in that journey. And we've been hearing Jesus calling to us. He's saying, pick up your cross, follow me, value children give it give me everything you have body mind soul spirit strength love your neighbor like you love yourself and as we follow after jesus we get to know jesus better and honestly that makes this ordinary time in the church anything but ordinary because we get to learn more about the person of jesus and so today's scripture lesson is from mark and it's often used as a stewardship Sunday s sermon. And I want you to know something about what a great sense of humor God has. I write these sermons several weeks in advance. I did not know that Signe was planning on getting up and talking to you about our stewardship and our financial uh, situation. But you know what? Guess who did know? God. God knew. And so he said, listen, I've got this plan for you. You're going to speak about this. But you've got to remind him, Anne, it's not about money. It's about something else. And so even though this sermon is, this, really this passage in Scripture is often used as stewardship, and we maybe have formed opinions about what this, this message means, I want you to open up your hearts and minds and let the Spirit speak to you this morning and let him decide what it is that we want to gather from this passage. So this is Mark 12, verses 28 through 34. As he taught, Jesus said, watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all that she had to live on. Now, obviously, this scripture is not just one story, it's two stories. And I don't know why Mark put them side by side in his gospel. I don't even know if they happened one right after the other. But I have a feeling that Mark did it, uh, and so we could have a way of comparison, the way of comparing the way two different kinds of lives were being lived. Jesus starts out with a condemnation of the well-to-do religious leaders, the teachers of the law, and... Um, they were the ones that, you know, sought out honor and respect from the others in their community. And uh, they were kind of flaunting uh, their long, 
glowing robes and having these big, long prayers. And they, they, were, they were wanting everybody to think that they really had it all together. While at the same time, they were being scandalous in their treatment of widows. Now, you know, rich people are never <laughs> really looked at very favorably in the New Testament. I don't know if you've noticed that. Um, they're never really in a favorable light. And I really think this should probably give us pause. Because like most Americans, you may not think that you are wealthy, but by global standards, you are. We are, by global standards, wealthy. Um, a survey by, or survey by the Washington Post asked Americans what they would guess that the global income, the median global income would be for people. And, most, um, and they, what most Americans said was right around $21,000. They figured that was about the global median income. When in fact, the global median income is $2,100. And according to the Washington Post, most Americans would estimate that they're probably in the top 37% of the wealthy in the world, when in fact, most of us would comfortably fit in the top 10%. And as a nation, we really have a disproportionate share of the wealth of the world. In the United States, we have about 4%, a little over 4%, I think it's 4.23% of the world's population. But we have 33% of the world's wealth. That's a big gap. And if that makes you a little bit uncomfortable, it probably should. It makes me uncomfortable to think about that. However, I want to be really clear that I don't think being wealthy is necessarily a bad thing because when you have resources, that gives us the ability to bless other people with our resources. That's really what the church is all about, is blessing other people through ministry and mission who might not be able to be blessed within, you know, the world. Um, and so you and specifically, church, I don't want you to get bummed out when you hear sources that say we're down with income and, you know, and we, ha and, and we have bigger expenses. I noticed nobody clapped when Signe sat down, and I felt a little sad because I was like, we should be clapping for her because that's a lot of hard work, and for her to have to get up there and talk like that, it's kind of like, ooh, what are people going to say? But the thing is, as a congregation, you're very generous. You're very generous. And whenever we come to you and say, hey, we have this need, you always rise to the occasion. I think the dangerous thing about having wealth, it's not in the possession of money. That's not the dangerous thing. The dangerous thing is when we believe in the false security that it provides. It's not dangerous to have money. It's dangerous to put your trust in the security that money provides because you know at any given time it could be gone. It could be gone. Even if you dig a hole and bury your gold in the backyard. I'm not suggesting that, but I'm just saying. A lot of things depend on outside forces that we don't have any control over. So we tread a very fine line spiritually when it comes to our finances. A instead of resting in the Lord for our provision and our protection and our security, we rest in our bank account. And being wealthy can be blinding. That was the problem in that passage that we saw today with these religious teachers. They had become blinded to their own greed, um, and they're seeking out all this flattery, and they're seeking out being elevated above other people, and while, all the while, they are exploiting the weak and the helpless. You see, a widow was at the mercy of her religious community to take care of her. Um, and if her community, if her religious community, if the Jewish community was following 
what God had said, then she wouldn't have had anything to worry about because we, we read in Exodus and we read in Psalms how God felt about taking care of the widows and the fatherless. Exodus 22, 22 through 23 says this. This is God speaking, saying, Do not take advantage of the widow or the fatherless. If you do, and they cry out to me, I will certainly hear their cry. God is saying, I'm going to provide for them because I'm going to hear them. And then Psalms 82.3 adds this, defend the weak and the fatherless. Uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. That's what the, the real law of love said. But over the years, the rabbis had a tendency to write laws in extra things that were to their advantage. And so one of the things uh, that we find is that in the Jewish law that was written by the rabbis, a widow could not inherit her husband's estate. Isn't that interesting? That wasn't written into the marriage contract. She didn't um, inherit her, her husband's estate if he were to die. Children would. They could inherit his estate, but a widow could not. In fact, the estate, guess where it would go? To the church. And then it was up to the rabbis to make a sale of her property and then give her a portion of it. But what the rabbis were doing was that they were selling houses right underneath, out from underneath the widow. Instead of allowing her to live there, they would sell that for their own property uh, profit. And that, that greed resulted in that poor widow that you, we read about this morning that contributed to her suffering. And Mark would contrast that attitude of those religious leaders with that of the poor widow. Because on one hand, we have the teachers of the law who are willing to do whatever they can, however unscrupulous that they're going to be to, to get fulfill their greed. And then we have, on the other hand, this poor widow who is willing to give everything she has, probably to her own detriment, because she knew that's what she should do. Because she trusted... She trusted her religious community to take care of her needs. I think it's really interesting that Jesus set up shop right across <laughs> from the temple treasury, isn't it? I wonder how we'd feel if Jesus walked in here <laughs> and started looking about what we put into the offering. I think some of us would be offended. I know I would be like, Lord, I give online. But in Jesus' time, the treasury was right in, the temple treasury was right in the middle of the open court. So, and really, the, the real reason was so that everybody would have access to be able to put money into the treasury. And, but what happened was that people who were quite wealthy, and they would bring in these, their big sacks of gold, and they would put it into the treasury and make a big show of it. The... Um, in order to put your money into the treasury, they didn't have like little white envelopes. You put them in and you put them in a padded plate. They had this big box and it had like a trumpet opening and it was made of metal. And then the receptacle was underneath. So you can imagine if you are dumping in coins, the sound it's going to make. Clink, 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 clink. And so if you had a lot of that, that's going to cause somebody to draw a lot of attention to themselves. And I kind of think that some people probably really stretched it out. Clink, clink, clink. Clink, 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 you know, just to get people to watch and go, oh, they're so generous. Now, obviously, Jesus was not impressed by any of these big offerings. He wasn't impressed by all these noisemakers. Instead, he chose to draw attention to the situation of this poor widow, these two little copper coins falling into the box and he called his disciples and once he says hey look you see what she did that is more she gave more than anybody else okay and now you know Matthew right the disciple Matthew who was the tax collector who was all about numbers and figures I think his mind went like this because he's like Lord you know that's like two cents how can that be more than all this other that people are putting in. And Jesus says, you know what? Others gave out of their wealth. 
In other words, they may have given large sums, but it is not going to affect their lifestyle. They're still going to be able to conduct their life just fine, giving out of their, ex- their excess. But she, she gave out of her poverty. She literally gave everything that she had. So what does that say about her? I mean, is she crazy? Is she crazy that she gave away all of her money that she would have to buy bread? Is she crazy to think that her religious community is going to take care of her? What did she have? What did she have that the religious leaders did not have? And I would suggest that she had a different perspective. That widow had a different perspective. She had a perspective of trust. And because, you know, church, even though this sermon has a lot of stuff about money, this isn't really about money. You know that, right? This is not about money. Because in our lives, our struggle really isn't with money. We don't have a money problem in the church. And I'm not just talking about West Newton, United Methodist Church. I'm talking about church universal. The church doesn't have a problem with money. The church has a problem with perspective. We have a perspective problem. And it's a problem that we really all have individually. Because it is hard for us as we struggle with the real truth of the matter is that we can trust ultimately in God to provide everything we need. And that's hard. That's hard to say, okay, I, I do believe that, Lord, that you can give me the truest sense of security and safety. Our struggle is never about not having enough money. Our struggle is a spiritual struggle. It's a spiritual struggle. And it really is truly a spiritual struggle to depend on God for our security and not what's in or not in our bank account. The widow depended on God to do what she knew he said he would do. And her generosity was this vital lesson to us about sacrificial giving, how sacrificial giving yields peace and security. It doesn't make any sense on paper, okay? It doesn't make any sense on paper. But when you give out of your heart, God will supply what you need. And cultivating this spirit of generosity really reveals itself in spiritual maturity. Spiritually mature people are generous people. Because they know that God will provide every need that they have. That is a lesson I learned early in life. Because I've told you before, when Phil and I first started out, we were so stinking poor. I mean, we both had jobs as teachers, but I'm telling you what, teachers, well, I don't know if you know this or not, but they don't make a lot of money. And we struggled financially. We were paying off college loans, and we had three kids right in a row, boom, boom, boom. And then I decided to quit my job and stay home. I mean, it was a financial struggle. But it wasn't until I had a spiritual revelation. It's not about dollars and cents. It's about what my heart says about God. Do I believe that God will supply my every need? And when I decided, yes, he would. Yes, he can. Yes, he does. Everything changed. Everything changed. I'm not saying we became millionaires and that we drove fancy cars. We always, you know, there's a lot of situations. It's not what you think. But the thing is, we didn't need any of that. We were happy with what we had because it gave us a different perspective about living. And living a generous life is what Jesus calls us to live. Now, in this particular situation, he's talking about monetary generosity. But as Christians, we should be living generously in all areas. We should be living generously in love. We should be living generously in forgiveness. 
We should be living generously in sharing our faith. Because we're called to be generous with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Those are fruits of the Spirit. When you cultivate this, this spiritual connection with Jesus and you cultivate a generous outlook, you begin to see that all those things, none of them are material. They all come from somewhere deep inside that says, I need to be generous with these things. So church, I want to challenge you this week to try to break free of the things that you put your trust in. The things that you put your trust in, and I challenge you to trust wholeheartedly in Jesus. Be sold out in your walk. Give him everything that is of real value. And it's not money. I mean, money is valuable, but the real value to Jesus is your whole heart. Your whole mind, your whole spirit all of your strength, and you live out that life in community by loving other people as much as you love yourself. I, I want to assure you, you can never outgive God. You never can outgive God. It, it's literally impossible. You can't outgive him. And so when we give everything to Jesus, give Jesus everything that we have, and we depend on Jesus for our security, true security, then you're going to find out Jesus is everything that we need. Will you pray with me? Father God, we don't like to think about money. I mean, let's just be honest. You know that about us. We don't like to talk about it. We don't like to consider it, and we certainly don't want to think that we put it above you. But Jesus, call us to a greater security in you. Help us to be sold out, humbly submitted, biblically formed disciples of Jesus Christ. We love you, Jesus. Oh, how we love you. And it's in your name we pray these things. Amen. What a wonderful time it is to come together with you in the body of Christ to share in this symbolic meal to remember Jesus. That we get to share together in the juice and the bread. And I would ask you at this time to join with me in our communion liturgy. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, and he gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. 
This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. As we proclaim the mystery of faith, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine and make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the whole world, the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. This is the body of Christ broken for you. The blood of the Lamb. out for you. I'd like to call the communion stewards down at this time. Church, we're going to experience communion again as we did before COVID. This is the body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you. This is the body of Christ. Christ broken for you, the body of Christ broken for you. What I'm going to ask you to do, church, when you come down the aisle is to make your hands like a little basket. And each communion steward that is tearing off a little piece of bread, they're going to drop that into the little basket as we receive communion. And then the next communion steward will have the cup, and they will hand you the cup. So you never have to reach in for anything. You are going to be served communion. And then if you wish, when you're finished, you can kneel at the altar, or you can take it back to your seat. There are baskets on either side that you can deposit your cups in, or if you take it back to your seat, you can put the communion cup in the back. Uh, It's our tradition that we proceed down the middle aisle and we return to our seats on the side aisle. Since we have uh, a lot of patterns of moving back and forth, um, I think I'm going to maybe go to the back with the anointing oil. So if you wish to get an anointing, um, I would say, meet me at the back of the church. So... As you know, as part of the United Methodist Church, we do believe in open communion, which means you don't have to be a member of this church to receive communion. And we truly do believe that if you feel God calling you, you should come and commune. The table is open. Come to the table.
Will you stand as we sing our final song together? Church, go now in the love, the peace, the mercy and grace that can only be found in the security of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.